being on today's webinar. My name is Eric Ostergaard. I am an application engineer with HBM ENCODE and will be presenting to you and also demonstrating uh, some software with uh, this particular webinar titled Vibration Analysis in ENCODE Quickworks. We've got uh, just three agenda items for our presentation today. What I'd like to cover with you guys is the frequency spectrum, uh, some tools that we can use to analyze frequency spectrum of measured data. We'll then go into a section where we'll cover how we can filter some of that frequency content. And finally, the third topic uh, that we will look into is something called frequency response, uh, where you might have a measured input as well as a measured output, and we would look at how the two relate to one another. Just as a reminder, ENCODE has three products within its software application. Uh, however, for today's topic, we're really going to be focusing on the middle one, which is ENCODE Glyphworks. Just in summary, Glyphworks is uh, a tool that's going to allow you to take measured test data. Uh, therefore, it's most often used by test engineers, and we're going to process that data, hopefully getting the answers we're looking for. And uh, for today's topic, a lot of that is going to revolve around uh, frequency content. So let's dive into an introduction to vibration analysis, and uh, we'll see how we can then begin to analyze this. So as engineers, and I'm assuming most of us have some type of a mechanical engineering background, if we were to ask what vibration is, we're probably going to gravitate to the definition 3.A. And that's really just some type of oscillation or periodic motion of a rigid or elastic body. That's really what we're going to be focusing on here. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see some representation of measure time series data, and we can clearly see that there is some type of oscillation or periodic motion in that. Uh, but what's really hard to determine uh, when we're just looking at things in the time domain is some more specifics about that frequency content. Are there certain frequencies uh, that are producing a lot of excitation, uh, and are those frequencies that we should be really concerned about? We, we know maybe a little bit more about our structure and how it responds to different types of frequencies. There's um, a concept of resonance that uh, our structures are going to uh, sometimes exhibit. This is true for very large structures, something like uh, civil applications like buildings and bridges. And it's also going to be true for very small objects, all the way down to uh, things that are the size of molecules. Now, for us, we're going to be somewhere in between uh, dealing with structures that uh, you commonly find uh, in aerospace, so on ground vehicles. But they're all going to have the same kind of response to different types of frequencies, some of them uh, being natural frequencies. And this would be if we had uh, a simplified single degree of freedom structure, uh, a natural frequency could be represented uh, by the square root of the stiffness over the mass. What we do know is that at small uh, amounts of input energy near those natural frequencies, we can expect to see very large vibrations. So uh, this idea is uh, something that uh, in some cases we might want to avoid. So if we're trying to design a structure uh, and we want it to uh, be able to last a long time, uh, we want to make sure that the type of inputs that are subjected to that uh, don't excite resonance in that structure such that we start to see very high cycles of stress. There are other applications, however, where that is maybe a desired thing. A uh, perfectly good example of this is something we find in all of our kitchens, and that's a microwave. Uh, the microwave uh, is designed to excite the water molecules in the food, thereby creating uh, additional heat via friction, and then we, we get uh, a quickly heated up cup of coffee. So these are just some concepts and some ideas about resonance and vibrations and how they play together. So what I'd like to do now is dive a little deeper into the frequency domain, and we're going to start to see where some of these tools come into play in the software. So one of the things that we need to understand is the dynamic response of our structures. Um, these structures are going to have more than one natural frequency. Uh, if we look at uh, the screen capture on the slide here, we've got uh, a model 
of some exhaust components and a muffler. And the different components within this assembly are going to have different resonance frequencies. And those resonances are going to have different shapes, so those natural frequencies are. If we were to, for example, focus in maybe on this tailpipe right here that's extending beyond the muffler, that one could have a natural frequency that is a flapping up and down. There may be another one that is torsional in nature. And those types of shapes or modes are going to have different uh, effects on uh, connectors, maybe uh, right here at this flange right here. Uh, so we need to understand how we can decouple the measured data and look at that in the frequency domain. And then also with that information and, and maybe a really good understanding of our structure itself, uh, we might be able to determine how we can, for example, define uh, an accelerated test on a shaker tape. So we need to come up with a methodology that allows us to take our measured time series data and then bring that into the frequency domain. This is actually something that was done quite a long time ago uh, in the late 1700s by uh, Fourier. And what it allows us to do is essentially represent our time series data as a series of sine waves. And we can see that on this slide right here. If our time series data looks like this plot in the upper right, uh, we can see that it's got some cyclic content in there. Um, perhaps not uh, the most complex time signal that we've ever seen, uh, but we can probably begin to see that it is made up of a series of sine waves. Uh, one of the sine waves, uh, the lower frequency one, seems to have a, a path that is closely following where my mouse is tracking. And we could probably begin to see what its amplitude might be. There are some higher frequency signals in this as well. And if we were to look at this the way that Fourier looks at this, uh, perhaps maybe in a three-dimensional plot like this, our time signal, which we can see here, and it is in the time domain along this axis, can then begin to uh, be separated out into a series of sine waves. And those are now represented in the frequency domain, where we can look at uh, the phase, we can look at the amplitude, and we can look at the frequency of each one of those individual sine waves. Adding them all together uh, would eventually give us our original time series data. The frequency domain can be plotted in the form of a PSD, or in this case, uh, an amplitude uh, spectrum, uh, spectral density, where we see now peaks that represent those four simple sine waves. Now, the PSDs that we're going to be using in everyday life are, are going to be a bit more uh, broadband than what we see here, uh, or at least uh, not as peaky. Uh, it's going to have quite a bit more frequency content into it, but this is essentially the way in which we're going to decompose our time history. So, when we add up all of our sinusoidal waves, um, they're going to create the original signal. So if we have this square wave that we see here in the slide, uh, some questions we can ask are, is it periodic? And is it a sine wave? Uh, clearly, it appears to be periodic, but at the moment, it doesn't look like uh, quite like a sine wave. However, with Fourier's transform, uh, you can now see that if we start to take into consideration more and more sine waves of different amplitudes and different frequencies, we could, in fact, begin to reconstruct something that is very close to that square wave. So that's something that uh, the Fourier transform is going to do, and we're going to see a demonstration of that in just a moment. Uh, before we do that, though, let's take a look at the two plots we have right here. Uh, the upper plot is measured time series data, uh, very likely road load data. It uh, does appear to be transient in nature where uh, we have uh, a lower amplitude signal for a period of time, and then maybe we, we uh, go over three potholes, uh, which would constitute uh, these larger amplitudes. And then that seems to be repeated two more times. If we were to do um, a Fourier transform on this, we might see a plot that looks like the second one here. And normally at this point, if this is a kind of a face-to-face -face interactive uh, presentation, I'd have people kind of break out into groups and, and think about uh, the different types of things we can determine just by looking at the frequency content. 
but since this is a webinar, uh, I'll just go ahead and go through the questions for you guys and, uh, and give you some answers to those. So for the first one, the sample rate of the time series data. Um, it's something that uh, unless you've intentionally changed a default setting, uh, we can actually infer what the sample rate of the time series data is just by looking at the maximum frequency that we see on this horizontal axis. Uh, that is currently set at 80 hertz, and uh, that would suggest sample frequency is going to be 160. So by, by convention, the maximum frequency that we would see in a PSD uh, would be the Nyquist frequency, and that by definition is going to be half of your sample rate. The next question, kind of interesting, what country was this data recorded in? Well, I'm going to uh, propose that it was probably recorded in North America. And uh, the reason why I might arrive upon a conclusion like that is because I see a spike here right around 60 hertz. Uh, so it's quite possible that uh, there was some interference uh, in the surrounding area where this test was conducted. And what it's doing is it's picking up uh, the 60 hertz uh, frequency content from other electrical devices that might be plugged into an outlet somewhere in the vicinity. The dominant frequency uh, is uh, most likely somewhere around here. Uh, I would say that that's uh, 10 to 11 hertz. And uh, that is very likely going to be due to road loads, uh, since it's fairly low in frequency. And then lastly, that dominant frequency is actually something that you're going to be feeling instead of hearing. Uh, the human ear uh, responds to uh, frequencies down to 20 hertz, so 20 hertz and up, uh, and therefore, uh, with that dominant frequency being just a little bit below that, it's probably something that we're going to feel instead of here. So there's a lot that we can really begin to uh, determine by looking at a PSD, and um, we can have a, a pretty meaningful discussion about the frequency content that we see there. Now, the next thing that I'd like to show you is something that we call the joint time frequency analysis. Um, this is something that you would typically use if your time history data uh, is transient, uh, as well as, as the frequency content in that. So the, the frequency content in the example that we see here is varying with time. Uh, probably the, the best analogy to use here is uh, imagine, for example, your measured time series data being uh, three to four minutes of a song. In the very beginning of the song, you have uh, perhaps just a few instruments playing, uh, the uh, the volume or the amplitude is fairly low, and that uh, over the course of, let's say, the first 15 or so seconds, uh, begins to increase in, uh, in amplitude. More instruments, more vocals come into play, and the frequency content of that is most certainly transient. Now, if we did just a regular FFT on this, or a Fourier transform, we would see uh, some type of a, a PSD plot. This one's been turned 90 degrees but it would be a representation of the entire time history. And what we'd like to do is maybe break this down into uh, a window width of a certain number of seconds in duration, and then plot that on a three-dimensional plot. And we've done that right here. So we have a, a 3D plot. Uh, the colors are representing the magnitudes. We have uh, going across uh, the horizontal axis here, we have time, uh, and this has actually been sized so that it lines up nicely with the, uh, the, the time series data down below. And then along the vertical axis right here, we have frequency, and that also lines up uh, with our, our PSD over on the right. And some of the things that we can see immediately are that there is uh, certainly uh, a lot of frequency content right around 40 hertz. You can see this uh, horizontal uh, bright spot on the plot. And that line right there suggests that the 40 hertz is present uh, throughout much of the test. We can also see that in the beginning of the test, right here where the mouse cursor is, we have uh, a period of time where there's some higher amplitudes occurring. That seems to die down for just a moment, and then it returns once more. Um, and then up at the top, we can also see some uh, higher frequency stuff. And uh, that isn't exactly horizontal. It seems to be trending upward. Uh, so maybe uh, there is some, uh, some increase in frequency as, as time was, time was uh, passing on. So this is joint time frequency analysis. We'll see a demonstration of this one as well in just a moment. 
The last one that I want to introduce to you guys is uh, something that allows us to take a closer look at frequency on components uh, or, or pieces of equipment that have rotating components. Um, gears, shafts, and pumps, these are all really good examples. And what we're going to be able to do is look at how the frequency content uh, changes uh, with uh, rotation as well. And uh, what we're going to be doing is calling that order. So let's take a look at a sample plot here. Uh, this particular plot is called a waterfall plot. Uh, and it also is uh, three-dimensional where we have frequency across the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is now going to be in terms of speed. Uh, so this is uh, for an automotive application on an engine. Maybe we're picking up uh, speed from the crankshaft. And what you end up seeing are a lot of radial lines that are going to appear on the plot. All these lines are going to eventually converge at zero, zero, somewhere uh, below our plot. And we have the ability to trace these, these lines, these lines being called orders. If, uh, if we look at this one, for example, this is going to be the second order. Uh, so for this particular engine, uh, four-cylinder engine, I believe it was a four-stroke, there is some significant excitation that is occurring two times every revolution. If we go a little bit further out, we have another uh, bright spot that has been uh, cursor traced, and uh, that would be the fourth order. So that one then suggests that there's something significant occurring four times every revolution. So what I want to do now is navigate to ENCODE. Let me go ahead and share that application with you guys. And what everybody hopefully should be seeing now is the ENCODE interface. And what I'd like to do is just grab some sample data. I have uh, some run-up data. Let's take a quick look at what this run-up data looks like. I'm going to maximize my input glyph. And we can see here that we have two channels of data. The first channel is our excitation or our input measured in uh, Gs. So we've got some accelerometer data. And then the second channel is our speed channel. This is what we're going to be using in the waterfall plot uh, in the third step of the demonstration. So for the first step, let's just take a look at the frequency content of our accelerometer data. And what I've done is navigated to the basic digital signal processing glyph palette. I'm going to grab my frequency spectrum glyph here. Let's drop it on the right spot. And uh, what I'm now doing is attaching uh, this glyph to my time series input glyph. We have a pipe connecting the, the two blue pads. And we're going to display this on an XY display. So if I run my process, we can now begin to see my data. And uh, what I'd like to look at is really just channel one. And let's take a look at uh, that with uh, a log scale on the vertical axis. So now we can see the, um, the acceleration, uh, the accelerometer data uh, in the frequency domain. We can see that there's a, a generally a downward sloping trend uh, where the, uh, the lower frequencies tend to have higher amplitudes uh, than the higher frequencies. The next thing that I'll show you is on um, the frequency glyph palette. And this is the joint time frequency analysis. And we're going to perform this on the same data. Let's go ahead and drag this one a little bit further down. And what I, what I want to do again is just focus in on this, uh, this accelerometer data, so channel one. And uh, let's go ahead and display this on our waterfall analysis, or our waterfall display. And scroll down just a bit and uh, make this plot a little larger. Now, for this particular plot, oftentimes what I'll do is uh, use the tools across the top so that I'm looking uh, from the top down. I'll also turn the carpet layers on. And then what I'll do oftentimes is, uh, again, uh, a log scale on uh, the z-axis. And now we begin to see some bright spots. So we can see that since this was an engine run-up test, uh, there are some higher frequencies that start coming into play 
as we get to the end of our test, end of our test being somewhere around 10 seconds. Uh, and that would, that would be um, something that we could uh, probably all agree upon. If, if you were standing next to this test and you could hear the engine running, uh, you'd hear those higher frequencies starting to come into play as we get into uh, the last few moments of that measured test. All right, the last one that I was going to show you is a waterfall plot. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to go to this waterfall analysis clip and drag that out onto the workspace. And what I want to do is connect it to my measured data. Now for this one, unlike the first two, I'm actually going to be using both of the channels. I'm going to use my excitation channel and I need to use my, my speed channel. And I need to tell the glyph which one is which. So let me go ahead and go into the properties. I'm just going to double click on this banner. And right here, we have a property for channels. This is going to ask us to define which one is the signal and which one is the speed. So we will just say channel one and channel two. So that's the signal and the speed channels. And let's go ahead and grab a display glyph so we can look at the results. Here we go. So let's run this process one more time. And once again, for the waterfall, uh, we can make this a bit larger. We'll look at it top down. We'll look at a carpet plot. And uh, let's start to make some of these things brighter. And for this one, the last thing that I want to do is really focus in on some of the lower frequencies. We've got a lot of, of bright spots there. There's a lot of excitations occurring. Um, two to 300 hertz or lower. So let's just double click on the banner, open up the properties of this glyph, and under limits, I'm going to uncheck the auto scale, and I'm going to define my maximum frequency as 300 on the plot. And now we can really start to see some of these bright spots. Uh, we can uh, trace cursors on this particular plot that's done right with this tool here. So if I click and hold just for a moment, you can see um, I can uh, trace the order. So let me go ahead and click on that. And now you can tell that uh, as I move my mouse, uh, I've moved it to right over that second order. This is something that appears in the upper left in the, in the yellow box. Oops, let me try that one more time. There we go. And if I click on that, I can create uh, a cursor on the second and then uh, the fourth order. These can be displayed as 2D traces. Let me go ahead and show that to you. If we go into the properties, now that I've created those two order cursors, let's go ahead and go to the Advanced tab. And I want to show the slices. So we'll turn this to True. You can see the cursors are already set on uh, something that is uh, very close to 2 uh, for our orders and 4. And now we can see. Uh, a trace, uh, red being the second order and blue being our fourth order. And, and that is going to be essentially uh, these bright spots that we're following on our waterfall plot. All right, let's go ahead and jump back into the PowerPoint material and take a look at the next section. So the next section is covering filtering. We've got quite a few different tools within ENCODE that allow us to do filtering. Um, some of them will allow us to focus in on, on the really important things. Uh, for example, if we've got a PSD that looks like the one below, and we're really only concerned with a certain section of that. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm not interested in uh, any of the frequency content beyond 60 hertz. I could do a low pass. Uh, filter at 60 hertz and see what the data looks like at uh, 60 hertz and lower. There are other times where maybe you want to focus in on a narrow range and uh, that's another type of uh, frequency filtering that we can do as well. Let's take a look at some examples here. So examples of filtering. Um, the very first one that we're looking at is um, is one that uh, is a low pass filter and it's going to be applied to the data on the right. So we've got uh, a plot of our time series data, the red being the unfiltered raw data, and you can see that it has quite a bit of higher frequency content in it. 
This is something that's done uh, on an automobile. Uh, accelerometer is probably located somewhere near um, the braking system, uh, somewhere on the suspension components. And what we're seeing here is longitudinal acceleration under braking. Uh, so we've got a lot of, it, a lot of uh, chatter that's occurring. It could be something uh, like the ABS uh, that's starting to, uh, to show up in, uh, in our measured data. And if we do a low-pass filter, uh, right at 5 hertz, we get a much smoother line, and that's going to be the blue trim on top of it. So if you're really interested in, in uh, this, this smoothed out data where we've taken out a lot of that higher frequency content, this is probably going to be the easiest thing for you to do. It's just to set up a low-pass filter uh, and then, uh, then analyze uh, the newly created time history, in this case, the blue curve. There are other times where we might want to do a high-pass filter. Uh, so this is going to keep um, frequency content that's above some con uh, cutoff point. Uh, it's really useful for getting rid of uh, low frequency content like thermal effects or any kind of drift that might appear in your measured data. And let's take a look at this last uh, filtering tool. So this is a relatively new tool in the Info product. Uh, it is called Order Tracking Filter. And it's something that you can use when taking a look at um, engine run-up data, where we have uh, an input channel uh, and a speed channel. And you want to remove some orders. Uh, so for example, if you have an unbalanced shaft, and uh, that un unbalanced um, weight is, is starting to contribute a lot to uh, the accelerations you see in the first channel, we could actually get rid of that first order wobble and then output uh, the newly filtered time history data. If you look at these two right here, there's not going to be a whole lot of difference in terms of the time domain. We can even overlay the two and, and take a look at that. Uh, but if we were to do a waterfall plot of both of those, what you'll find out is that bright spot, uh, in this case the first order, is going to be removed in the second waterfall plot. It becomes really easy to visualize that uh, if we do a comparison of two waterfall plots. Well, let me go ahead and give you guys a demonstration of two of the filters. We'll do a Butterworth filter, and then we'll do an order filter. And uh, for that, we'll jump back into ENCODE. And I'm going to go ahead and just keep the current process that I've been working on. So I'll scroll back up to the top. And let's go ahead and uh, just drag these two clips a little bit more to the right. And I will grab a Butterworth filter. So let's go ahead and filter my measured data. And we can even, let's go ahead and once we've filtered the data, let's do a frequency spectrum analysis on that. And we can overlay it on the same plot. So in this example, what I'm going to do is a low pass filter. And if we take a look at my measured data, let's, let's define that cutoff frequency as uh, 400 hertz. So what I want to do is attenuate all frequency content that is, is beyond 400 hertz. We'll go into the properties of the Butterworth filter. We'll define it as a low pass. It's already set up for that. And our frequency will be 400. Let's go ahead and plot that. And uh, we'll need to, let me change one thing. I want to make sure that I'm displaying two displays. There we go. And if we enlarge that, we can see that uh, as we start approaching 400, everything that's below that, uh, the two curves lie on top of one another, and they should. But as we start to approach 400, and then uh, just a little bit beyond 400, what we're doing is we're starting to really get rid of, uh, attenuate uh, the frequency content, and then somewhere closer to uh, maybe 450, uh, it doesn't look like there's really any frequency content at all remaining in the filtered data. So that's a pretty good example of uh, using a Butterworth filter to remove some high frequency content. The next one that we're going to look at is uh, something that we can, uh, we can do um, to remove an order. So let's go ahead and grab the order tracking filter. Bring that one here, and I'm going to take my time series data. We will tie that right in here. And just like with 
our waterfall analysis tool, we need to go into the order tracking filter and define some properties. I need to let it know what channel is my input channel. It's going to be channel one. And then which channel is my speed channel. And then I can define an order in which I want to filter out. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's do band stop. And we'll do it on the second order. Let's select the OK button. And something else, if we want to do some neat graphical displays here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, copy paste my waterfall and the display of it. We'll drag that across. And uh, let me make sure that I've got my speed channel so that it can be displayed as well. And run the process. All right. If I maximize the first one, you'll see that I have a cursor right on that second order, and it's pretty bright. This is the raw data. And we have uh, the red curve representing that second order. So it's got some pretty good uh, accelerations present. If we then look at the second waterfall plot, this cursor is in uh, a blue area. So we've got uh, a scenario now where we filtered out just that particular order. And that becomes really clear when we look at, at, at it on uh, a 2D slice. Uh, the red curve uh, is essentially not showing up at all. We've, we've removed that, that acceleration content entirely from our data. And uh, if you wanted to, we could even overlay the time histories. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'm going to grab uh, one more display here. I'm starting to get a lot of displays on here. I'm going to grab my time series data that has been filtered uh, with the second order. And let's go ahead and grab the raw data as well. OK. So if I maximize this particular plot, the first graph that we see in red is going to be our raw data. The second one is showing us our accelerations after it has been filtered, after we've removed that second order. Uh, and if you were to overlay these two, you can do that with the overlay button, you'll see that there is some difference. Uh, although, just from a visual perspective, it would be really hard for us to, to say much more than that by looking at it in this particular plot. We've removed frequency content, but we can't really uh, quantify that. Um, and that's where doing side-by-side -side comparisons on waterfall displays might be a, a better graphical representation of, of what you've actually removed from the frequency content. All right, let's go back into our presentation, and we'll go into the very last section. And uh, this particular section is going to be focusing on the frequency response analysis. So what we've just learned is that uh, we can use the frequency, con uh, frequency spectrum to determine how much vibration energy is present uh, at different frequencies. What that won't allow us to do is compare two channels where we have uh, an input and an output. Uh, so we have uh, a schematic down below that is showing us uh, we've got some type of an input uh, response here. This is uh, perhaps something that's caused by um, road loads. And then we're measuring a response closer to our component. In this case, it's going to be some type of headlight. And what we'd like to know is how are these two related to one another? Are, are there ways in which we can describe ratios of the output acceleration to the input? And can we do that in the frequency domain? Uh, the answer is yes. And we're going to be doing this with a frequency response function. So let's take uh, a look at the next page here. When we measure this frequency response function, um, we're going to be exciting the system uh, with known inputs. We can do this over a broad range of frequencies. Uh, typical ways of doing this are going to be things like a sweep, if we're doing some type of an indoor test. Uh, perhaps it's a wrap test, uh, where uh, we've instrumented the, uh, the hammer as well as the structure that we're wrapping. 
And then we're going to measure the response and calculate the characteristics of the output and input uh, versus frequency. Some typical things that you might uh, be looking at. Uh, there's a lot of different output types that we can generate from this type of analysis. Uh, some of the more common ones, though, will be things like gain. So the very first plot that we see here is the gain that we see from uh, the input to the output. If you have a gain that's close to one, which is what we see here in uh, most of the frequencies that are 70 hertz and below, um, there, there's essentially no amplification. As we get closer to 160, however, we can see that the gain is increased to 3.5. Uh, so that is suggesting that we're probably getting closer to some type of natural frequency in our structure. And if we excite it with a frequency that is around 160 hertz, uh, we're going to start to see larger amplitudes uh, in that excitation. This might be um, a warning bell for us where we have uh, some frequency range that we'd like to avoid. Uh, maybe we can, uh, if this is, um, for example, um, the seats uh, for the, the bus driver uh, in a commercial bus, uh, maybe we can do something to the suspension system within that seat to um, remove um, or, or change the gain, remove the, uh, the, the amplification that we see in that particular frequency. What might also be important in that particular scenario is, is to have a really good understanding of how the human body responds to different frequencies. And if 160 hertz happens to be something that the human body is sensitive to in a seated position, uh, then we should certainly uh, look closer into trying to reduce the gain in that particular frequency. Other things that we might see are phase. So this is how much uh, the input is going to either lead or lag um, the output. And then we have coherence as well. And this is going to actually show us the, uh, going to give us an idea of the linearity between the input and the output. Let me go ahead and give you a demonstration of this particular analysis tool. We'll go back into ENCODE and just so that we can keep um, let me go ahead and I'll just clear this out and we'll start with uh, a new a new time uh, series data file and this one has two channels in it. If we look closely we will see that they are both channels of acceleration uh, the first one, which is channel six, uh, and then the second one is just channel number nine. And we're going to use those as our input and our output. Let's go back to our frequency spectrum cliff palette here. And we will go to the frequency response analysis. And let's go ahead and go into the properties of this. Just like with the waterfall analysis, I need to tell this glyph which channels are which. So I'm going to define my input as channel number six. I'm going to uh, define my response as channel number nine. And I'm going to focus in on just one of the analysis types, and that is going to be the gain. And uh, we can then OK those properties and grab a display glyph. So what we'll do is an XY display on our histogram data that will be coming out of this red pad. And if I run this process and maximize the results, we can now see that uh, in the very low frequencies, our gain did in fact start out around one. But as we started to increase the frequencies up to somewhere around 160 hertz, uh, our gain is, is continually increasing. Uh, perhaps there's some natural frequencies uh, coming into play here. And then as we go beyond that, our gain actually starts to drop off. So this is uh, one way in which we can do some comparison between those two acceleration channels. All right, so let's go ahead and just wrap up um, with a summary of our presentation today in the form of a table. What we've learned is that uh, Time is most often going to be our independent variable, but there's a lot of things that uh, we might not be able to determine just by visually looking at our time. Uh, advantages of, of time is that, sure, we can, we can easily visualize uh, what, what we would often call a squiggly line. Uh, the, 
the oscillations that are present in our time series data. We can see transient behaviors as well. Um, however, it's going to be much more difficult to, to try and pick out patterns um, that uh, are occurring in the frequency domain. So that's kind of where we would we would then go to this second row right here, convert things into the frequency domain with, with one of uh, the analysis tools that we saw today, uh, often starting off with uh, just a simple Fourier transform. And that's going to allow us to really pick up on patterns that are occurring in the frequency domain. Uh, the, the files themselves or the data representing uh, this frequency domain can actually be significantly smaller um, than the data that we have for our time domain. Uh, obviously, it depends on the duration of your time domain uh, and the sample rate. Um, we can do quite a bit of averaging uh, on our frequency content. Um, a, a Fourier transform uh, has a couple of options. We didn't really dig too deep into it here, but uh, there are things that we can do to, to linearly average um, the frequency content over a long time history, or maybe we want to be a bit more conservative and we might choose um, a, a, an option called peak hold. Uh, some of the disadvantages that we have when we're looking at just the frequency content is we've really lost all concept of time. Uh, the duration uh, of that uh, original time series data that we looked at and, and, and extracted the frequency content from is, is no longer a, a piece of relevant data in the frequency domain. Uh, transient behaviors, uh, to a degree, they can be lost, uh, although if we, if we use a tool like the joint time frequency analysis, uh, maybe we can still preserve some of that transient nature. And lastly, it can be a bit difficult to get the amplitudes right when we have a broadband process. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we've got a lot of tools that uh, allow you to dig deeper into um, the frequency analysis uh, side of things. Uh, where we're looking at uh, maybe just frequency across a single event, uh, maybe joint time frequency if we're interested in transient effects, or um, waterfall analysis if we've got rotating components in our in our structures that are that are producing signals that uh, occur once, twice, or maybe four times per revolution. So we have just covered uh, our three main agenda items. Uh, going over frequency analysis, filtering, and frequency response. And at this time, what I'd like to do is open things up for any questions that any of the audience members might have.